And on that note, I'd like to invite Cynthia to share her thoughts and views with us. She will take roughly about 21 minutes, she told me. <laughs> Cynthia, over to you. Okay, I think it'll be um, a little bit more than 21 minutes, maybe 22. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you this morning. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Those are the words of Mario Savio, a student organizer at the University of California at Berkeley in the 1960s. I was too young to understand them at the time, but I understand those words now. And I have organized my life around those words ever since. I decided that every day when I rise from my bed, I will ask myself, what can I do to resist? And so I've chosen to resist government lies and propaganda. Every day I resist war. I resist the daily insults to human and earth dignity. I'm proud to proclaim that I've chosen whose side I'm on. I'm on the side of truth. I'm on the side of justice and I'm on the side of peace. I'm on the side of dignity. I am on Tun Dr. Mahathir's side. I am on Perdana's side. I am on the side to criminalize war, and that means I'm on your side. I want the people of Malaysia to be able to live without intrusions from non-Malaysians and for you to be able to resolve your issues without outside interference. And I want that for every people in every country on this planet. And I want the planet to be respected so that it can continue to sustain life and every life must be a life worth living. I'd like to thank Tun Dr. Mahathir and Tun Dr. Siti, the Perdana and Criminalized War families for inviting me to be here with you today. And I'd like to also thank all of you in the audience for supporting my presence here over the years. It was in 2005 that I first came to Kuala Lumpur and declared this beautiful, wonderful city to be the peace capital of the world. I've come back every year full of hope as I joined with the Perdana Peace Organization in pursuit of this illusory goal. But I have to admit that my optimism has begun to wane. My faith in this work is being tested. And while I'm absolutely certain of the correctness of our way, I've begun to ask different questions. For if we continue to do things as we have done them, I'm afraid we'll continue to get what we're getting now. So much talk about justice and so little justice. So much talk about peace and so little peace. And honestly, I'm tired of losing, precisely because I know that most people are good and honest. Most people want the best for their families and don't want to deny that to others. Most people want the truth and most people want peace. I want to take you back for just a moment to 2001. Republicans had just stolen the U.S. presidency, taking office against the will of U.S. voters in the 2000 election. And as a member of Congress, I investigated that. I was the only member of Congress to do so. After that, the big issue of 2001 was the Durban World Conference Against Racism. I headed the Congressional Black Caucus Task Force and went head to head and toe to toe 
with the pro-Israel lobby that was determined to have the U.S. boycott the conference so that Zionists wouldn't have to defend their practices against the Palestinians. So they did everything in their considerable power to win the argument. But it was such a bad argument. And I was just as determined to have the U.S. participate in the conference. And so they lost. And I went to Durban. And I took five members of the Congressional Black Caucus there with me. I had commissioned an investigation into murders of members of the Black Panther Party that had occurred as a result of a U.S. government program that targeted individuals because of their political beliefs. I hand-delivered that investigation to Mary Robinson, who was the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the U.N. at the time. I was particularly outraged about Durban because I was expected to give up the opportunity to, dis to discuss my grievances so they could avoid having a discussion about Zionism. So indigenous people from all over the planet being robbed of their sacred lands and even their right to life were not seen to be as an important part of a conversation. Africans still stinging from the loss of millions of individuals snatched from the continent in the massive transatlantic slave trade were to remain mute about how that crime against humanity affected them. Blacks in the diaspora, quiet about the indignity suffered on a daily basis. We were supposed to just forget our pain and suffer in silence because the Zionists didn't want us to talk about Palestine. To be honest, I didn't even know what a Zionist was. All I knew was that I had been asked to sign a pledge for Israel when I first became a candidate for Congress. And after refusing to do so, my congressional career became trench warfare, hand-to-hand -hand combat, just to remain in the Congress. Ever since my refusal to sign that pledge for Israel, the pro-Israel lobby let me know that my political neck was in the hangman's noose. It was the pro-Israel lobby that decided to tighten that noose when I questioned the Bush administration's actions on and after 911, I asked the question then, what did the administration know and when did it know it about the tragic events of September 11th? I was in Washington that day and experienced the most chaotic and confusing day of my life. But my gut told me that this was nothing new. I was experiencing what I had read about so many times before, I figuratively stepped outside of myself and watched as we members of Congress gathered on the Capitol steps. I was a critical observer at the members only briefings and I noticed everything. When I traveled to Europe and England, I encouraged citizen investigations of 911 and I learned that to question 911 was to be labeled an anti Semite. Even more bizarre, those who questioned the tragedy were equated with Holocaust deniers, and I wondered why. By demanding an independent investigation of what happened on September 11th, I became a political pariah. I was vilified in the press, and the noose tightened around my district. The pro-Israel lobby found someone to run against me, gave her over a million dollars for her campaign, and then managed to make the election turn out the wrong way for me. Needless to say, I know now what a Zionist is. I wanted to take you back to those days because I think it's important for us as, a people, as people of color to understand where we were in the heady days of Durban. Europe abandoned the U.S. position and admitted that the transatlantic slave, tra slave trade was a crime against humanity. I met indigenous people from Latin America, from Peru, Ecuador, black people from Brazil and Colombia, First Nations people from all over North America, and we were making our way together. And then, on the morning of September 11th, 2001, the World Trade Center towers came falling down. 
the topic of conversation immediately changed, and today humanity is on the brink. We lost a lot that day. A new level of criminality and immorality has been breached. Whole societies are being wiped off the map, while a sitting president of the United States openly advocates targeted assassination of U.S. citizens on U.S. soil. State crimes against democracy in the name of democracy have become the norm. And as with colonialism and neo-colonialism, even our identity has become so warped, we don't know who we are or what we should stand for, and so we are misled, acting on behalf of someone else's agenda, even to our own ultimate demise. All of this is the progeny of 11 September 2001. So what really happened on 11th of September? Much more than I can say within my short time today. But the people all over the world hunger for the truth and refuse to let the lies stand. We need to know more. I'm saddened when I hear people say they are afraid. Afraid of what? Knowing that your government has been hijacked and that those in charge will lie to you? Such knowledge should actually set us free to do what we must to maintain our own dignity. And as if 1911 wasn't convincing enough of the need to fight Islamic terrorists after September, uh, September 2001, there was Bali, Madrid, London, and Mumbai. With bombs raining down on Gaza right now, I remember what the Israeli Prime Minister said. He said, we're all Israelis now. I agree that terrorism is a problem, and I know who the terrorists are. Dick Cheney told us to expect war for the next generation and drew up a list of 60 target countries. General Wesley Clark informed us of Pentagon plans to go to war against seven countries in five years. Iraq, Sudan, Somalia, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, and Iran. Syria is in process, and only Lebanon and Iran are left standing. But I'm sure their turn will come soon, too. General Wesley Clark called it a policy coup. He said that there had been a policy coup inside the United States. Not even one month ago, the former number two at the State Department, Lawrence Wilkerson, Colin Powell's right-hand man, said that what has happened in the U.S. is worse than a coup. The U.S. media would have you believe that the U.S. is divided. None white versus white, Christian versus Muslim, native-born versus immigrant, white versus Latino. I disagree with that. I've traveled into every nook and cranny of the United States, and I can tell you that people are united and sick and tired of war. The meme of division is developed by those who write the scripts in order to pit us against each other. That way, we forget to focus on those who planned September 11th, those who profiteer from war and killing, and those who, like cowards, vote to send our young men and women off to fight someone else's wars or worse, remain silent even while whole countries are being destroyed. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that our lives begin to end the moment we remain silent about the things that really matter. He also said there comes a time when silence is betrayal. I heard those words too. So while I hope that my actions combined with the actions of millions of others who also want justice and peace will change the world, the best I can do right now is to change myself. I am now in a PhD program that I absolutely love, and I'm studying leadership and change. We need both. And I've added new meaning to that word in my vocabulary, resistance. I wake up every morning and I ask myself, what can I do to resist war and injustice today? Today is the beginning of people who hunger and thirst for the truth to come together. I know that there is a worldwide community that is ready to know what happened on September 11th. As I have said too many times, 
We all know what we saw, but how did it happen? As a member of Congress, I asked, how could the U.S. invest trillions of dollars in an intelligence and military infrastructure and it fail four times in one day? As a black person, I knew that the Bush administration explanation of the U.S. being hit because we were free couldn't hold water because an election had just been stolen and the people of the United States weren't free. And they're even less so today. This exercise in revisiting 911 and seeking the truth could serve a great cause in helping people have the courage to face the truth about our current course. This mere informational exercise with resolve could result in a concrete end to impunity. Finally, two thoughts. One, we need people with a moral compass in public office today. We need people willing to resist injustice and war in public office. Members of the Bush administration committed crimes against the American people, as well as international crimes, some of which have no statute of limitations. That continues under President Obama. The only way we can arrest this lawlessness is to hold them to account, not just in people's tribunals, which have their place, but also in courtrooms around the world. The last thing I want to mention is about stand-down orders. Pay very close attention to what is happening in the U.S. around Benghazi Gate, as it is being called. A U.S. ambassador and three security agents are dead because someone reportedly issued a stand-down order three times. At least one general has been fired reportedly because he ignored the stand-down order and went to the rescue. As we revisit Secretary of Transportation Mineta's 911 testimony, the issue of a stand-down order arises. If a stand-down order was given to allow events to transpire in Benghazi, might that be relevant in a different setting? In short, we must never again allow this level of criminality in those who have positional authority over us. Never again. Now, with the chairman's indulgence, I have a short video that I'd like to show that on how I practice my own resistance. Imagine the U.S. Imagine Israel-Palestine. Imagine Libya, Somalia, Yemen, and Pakistan. Imagine China and Russia. Imagine Latin America with, imagine Malaysia if we had average ordinary Americans with morality and compassion making U.S. foreign policy. Incredibly, just in the last few days, 535 members of Congress unanimously voted to support Israel's Operation Pillar of Cloud. And I'll conclude with this. Bobby Kennedy, who almost became President of the United States, but assassin's bullets cut him down instead, said, some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say, why not? This 911 International Conference could allow us to dream again. And for that reason alone, its efforts are welcome and well worth it. Thank you. So.